Hey, good evening, everyone. This is Hunter. Um, I'll be doing this solo tonight. Um, John Bell has been too busy to, uh, to break away from some of the projects he's involved with. And TJ Neely had recently just got his COVID shot, so he's still feeling like roadkill. So, but I did want to get um, my results, my LBL investigation out to you guys. It's been uh, over a month now since we, uh, we introduced this on Dogman Cams, um, the original LBL uh, research effort. Um, and just to bring everyone um, kind of up to speed, and for those of you who have seen this the first time, um, I'm a researcher and I had planned on um, combining or looking to see if I could combine the LBL stories that currently existed, which was Kumbo's story, uh, Jan Thompson's story, uh, Victor Johnson's story, um, and then Roger came forward with his story and he's a survivor from an LBL attack. And so I had four four stories um, of content that I was going to try to combine into one story to later be published in a, a book on cryptids that I'm working on. And so we met a month ago on dogmancams.com uh, on, on their podcast and discussed the project. Um, and so here we are. I'm at the end of my investigation and research. I have concluded um, what I think really happened. And I want to present the evidence to support that, that hypothesis. Um, and uh, for all the people that have helped, um, that sent emails and, and suggestions um, to uh, Saxon Warlord, um, he shared that with me. And we went over the material, and I did add some additional content. I did change some things. I was able to do a Q&A with Roger. Um, that actually changed everything. It changed my complete outcome. And I was able to conclude um, almost that night after I had talked to, or you know, chatted with him uh, online. So, but before we get started, um, there's been this, um, this video going around. Now it's in Spanish of a gentleman that claims to have hit a dog man and killed it with his car. Um, people sent me emails about it. Um, other researchers have called me about it. And it just turns out it's that that video has been pulled from um, an NVTV video, which I'll show you guys. And just so if you see it floating around, it's not real. Um, so real quick, I'm going to share my screen. All right, now I'm going to play this this video for you, so you can you can see. When you see this, you'll know where it came from. Okay, this is an NVTV video that came out in March of um, this year. This is an alleged dog man that was hit by by this guy's car, and it looks pretty scary looking. It's it's got some of the features of a dog, man. You got a muzzle with teeth and you don't see blood, but you see some kind of like moisture. But this is a movie prop. And you'll see why it's a movie prop because the guy that made it will be in the next um, PowerPoint slide deck I show you. So, but get a good look at it. It's got blood on it, but it's not, you know, dripping blood anywhere. So that's all fake. But you'll see in the video, it doesn't have much hair on it. Okay, so a dog man should be covered with hair. Also, if you notice, the forearms are not very long. A dog man's known to have long forearms. And you can see that this thing has human-like legs, not dog legs. So when you see this video, and you can go to NBTV and look up this particular video, and you can see it if you want. Um, but I want to make sure that um, uh, you guys... You guys saw it and knew what it was before you ran into it and thought, wow, look, a real dog man. Well, it 
it's not a real dog man. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, bulletin that I put together and I sent out to uh, some other researchers. Um, I'll also, for those folks that, at, that um, asked for access to Saxon Warlord's hard drive uh, with regard to the LBL material, I will also send you a copy of this so that you have it. And so that if, you know, you see this video floating around, you'll, you'll kind of know how to address it, and what the origins are. So give me one second. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so this is what I sent out. Now, here you have a photo of of this creation, this dog man that was created out of latex and the guy that created it. And you can see in the photo that, um, you know, it looks pretty scary, but, you know, it's missing a lot of the features you would expect to see on a dog man. Um, but nevertheless, it looks scary. And when, you know, <clears throat> uh, Hollywood people get involved, I mean, they can make things look very realistic. So. Now, here's some of the, the still photos from the video itself. Well, we, we already discussed, we don't think it's a dog man because in terms of, of the creature that was created, that was made, this dog man, although it has a dog head, it's not, doesn't have any hair, it's not covered with fur. Well, dog men, all dog men have been reported to be covered with fur of sorts. Um, and this type of dog man would probably have um, a big hump on his back, on his shoulders, and a mane. And there's some that don't. You know, the, the hyena ones apparently don't have that feature. And I think the Doberman Pinscher versions don't have that um, feature of having a mane. But um, the one thing you would see is um, with a dog man, you have extended forearms. So everyone that sees a dog man talks about how the the arms are long, but it's really the forearms that make the, the arms long. Um, in this case, you can also see the fingers uh, and an opposable thumb. Well, a dog man doesn't have a thumb. A dog man has five fingers. So, you know, that's a giveaway right there. And not to mention you're looking at the legs and the legs are straight. They're human-like. Okay, so a dog man is going to have dog legs. So... That's the first giveaway, it's not a dog man, but I know someone's like, wait, it could be a werewolf. Well, let's just look at that. Why it's not a werewolf? Well, it's got a dog head for starters. That's the first giveaway, it's got a dog head. Um, although it does have um, the arms and an opposable thumb that you would expect to see on a werewolf because a, a werewolf has four fingers and opposable thumb. Um, the feet look a little short for a werewolf. A werewolf's foot will be uh, a little bit longer than that, I think. Um, and it'll have one-inch claws sticking out um, of each toe. It also has a mid-tarsal break, uh, which allows it to um, run on all fours and, and climb, you know, very difficult terrain as well as trees easily. So just to point that out. So hopefully that's, that's helpful for you guys when you run to this video or someone touting pictures that they killed a dog man or whatnot. This is the source of what's currently going around. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is present to you the final report and conclusions of my LBL investigation. Uh, and it really centers around the uh, family tragedy that occurred on 7 April, 1982. Um, as being told by its only survivor, a gentleman by the name of Roger. And just to recap um, some of the uh, incidents that, that led up to this point. So for those of you that are new to watching this and didn't see the last, um, the first uh, segment of this story, it was actually on dogmancams.com uh, approximately a month ago, and it's about the LBL. And this was um, about, you know, my attempt to take the stories of that we knew of the LBL and combine them into one, if possible, and have a, a, a very full length, detailed story of the incident. And I thought that, OK, so we currently have, you know, there's there's three or four prevailing stories out there if, and they're all about the same incident, I thought. And. If we could combine them together, we would really have a very detailed long story instead of you know three or four short fragmented stories that that tell pieces of the incident but don't actually tell the whole incident. 
Well, as I was preparing this and I put my initial uh, analysis out for peer review to some other researchers, um, Roger comes along. So um, I kind of stopped what I was doing. I listened to Roger's story. I thought, wow, okay, so this is pretty, this is pretty detailed. Then it's, it's a from, uh, beginning to end story and from a survivor. So I thought, okay, well, this will be great. And so I included that started working on it and um, I shared this with everyone about a month ago on dogmancams.com. So here we are, I've completed my investigation and research on the subject and I'm here to present that to you guys. So as we get started in this, I'm gonna walk you through, you know, all my conclusions. But before we get actually into my analysis, some of the the listeners did suggest I include additional source material. And thank you for that. Um, it turned out to be valuable. So in this case, um, one of the uh, videos and stories I included was from World Bigfoot Radio, The Beast of the LBL. And that features a researcher by the name of Jerry Klein, who tells his story that he got from you know, a dying fish and game officer that was there at the event. And you'll find that this, this story kind of aligns with Kumbo's story in many ways um, and actually provides a little more detail than, than Kumbo's story. But I think that Kumbo and him are talking of the same event. Now, I had heard this once before, but I'd kind of forgotten about it. And someone pointed out I should consider this, and I'm thankful they did. And there was also another one from the Eugene Johnson show, Terror at Land Between the Lakes. I found that to be more of a rehash of... Um, uh, some of the other material I had, and it was not as detailed, and there were some embellishments in there I wasn't really comfortable with, with using, so I, I kind of left that one out after reviewing it. Now, the, the Kunbo, or the World Bigfoot Radio um, version, talks about a very, very large creature, let, around 11 foot, 6 inches tall. So that is a different creature than what Roger described. Roger described a creature we know as a werewolf. It was about six foot five. Um, so about half the size of this other creature. So there was no confusing um, those two. And there were other um, details about this story that didn't fit in Roger's story that, that I'll reveal as we go through this. But um, I just wanted to let you know that if you watched the last show, I didn't include this material as source material in the last show. So now I'm including this, and I just want to walk you through it, and you'll see as we go through this, you know, where it kind of falls in things. So the one thing that, um, that makes Roger's story different and stands apart from the others, well, one, he's the only survivor, the rest are, are stories that were provided by other researchers from mostly um, anecdotal or um, witness accounts that are no longer living or refuse to talk. So in, in Roger's story, um, he talks about the creature that, that killed the family, and we found it to be um, a werewolf. And I, I determined it was a young male werewolf. And why do I know that? Well, because um, males only come in the color black for starters, you know, females come in a variety of colors, uh, but, but males are black. Um, and I think he was six to 10 years old. And that's because on average, these creatures grow about a foot per year until they reach about seven feet tall. Then their growth and height, it tends to slow down quite a bit. And the largest specimens, you know, reaching over nine feet tall, but on average around eight feet plus. And so I, I'm guessing he was probably um, anywhere from six to 10 years old, um, probably closer to the six, seven, eight year old range. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what we think, or I think the, the, the creature actually was. And it's not this gigantic creature that was described in, um, by uh, World Bigfoot Radio. So let's go into the final report. So I'm going to go you, walk you through the, um, you know, the table of contents here, quick review, which you know, I think I just covered. Uh, what we knew before we started the investigation, what we found out at the end of the investigation, you know, what do we know today, 
and then reviewing the evidence um, and then my conclusions. So what do we think we knew going into this investigation? Well, I talked to several other researchers had, um, and had read most of the material on the LBL already. Now, the purpose for me doing this was to include this story in a book that I'm writing on cryptids. So what we found is there was more than one story about a family that had perished in the LBL at the hands of a cryptid, okay? So, but we were all under the belief that the stories described the only um, family to perish at the hands of a cryptid in the LBL. These stories all had similar themes, but were different. I'm gonna guide you through a chart that kind of shows you know, what that really means. Um, there were no living witnesses to these attacks until Roger came forward. Um, we knew we weren't going to get any help from the media or from any of the fish and game or wildlife officials or you know, federal officials, or even from locals for that matter. Um, there's no evidence to support any of these stories. Um, we have no bodies, we have no creatures, no nothing. Yet they persisted for you know, almost 40 years as, as being the truth. And so we're taking them as that. I treated all the stories and the witness statements the same as if they were real. Um, you know, there might be other stories out there I haven't included or haven't heard yet uh, that we add to the original investigation. Um, I did add one, of course, to this one before I, I got to my conclusions. Um, we also thought that, hey, people that would protest Roger's story or this investigation that I'm doing were all people who thought they had something to lose, and that proved out to be true. So this is what we discovered. The source material describes more than one incident that occurred in the LBL, not the same incident. Okay, so we thought that this was, you know, one family and there was, you know, 40 years later, you know, one tail grew, to, grew into three or four tails. Well, no, that's not, that's not it at all. These were all separate incidents. Um, through a one-on-one Q&A with, with Roger, I was able to fill in some blind spots in my investigation um, that, that really covered some important details, and that changed everything from my investigation. I was able to conclude that night um, basically um, what his story was all about, and that was very, very helpful. It was, it was just that few minutes of him and I chatting that I was able to close up all the gaps that in the previous four interviews I'd seen him in that were hours long, um, he, he didn't really close up. It wasn't covered. Now, granted, I'm searching for um, some details that others aren't gonna care about because I'm working on a book. So I wanna complete the story. And other people were, were the other researchers, they were more focused on on really on establishing Roger's credibility as opposed to trying to determine if his story was credible. I think if you if you go to the the route that you're proving the story is credible, it'll reveal the character of the person telling it. So uh, in this case, I watched him go through a couple of character assassinations and we didn't get much out of him about the story at all. And so that was a waste of a few hours, but I mean, he, he didn't know what he was getting into and, and he, you know, he, I don't know if he was misled or not, but um, nevertheless, it really wasn't a good experience for anyone. I don't even think the audience enjoyed it, but um, hey, it is what it is. And, um, you know, some of these things you stumble into and you really don't have a plan, you try to go with the flow, so. Um, researchers uh, discussing this on YouTube, they were not aware of the type of creature that Roger was describing. They're not familiar with a werewolf, and I don't know why, but it's either a dog man, a Bigfoot, or some other um, obscure, exotic creature that, that hardly anyone's ever heard of. So I, I, I really was confused by, by the lack of knowledge on this particular type of cryptid. So it was, that was a little baffling. But um, the other thing I noticed that um, was a little troubling was you know, researchers are focused on using investigative methods commonly used for human crimes 
not the methods used for cryptid crimes. Okay, so for humans, when you're investigating a human crime, you know, a police officer is going to be looking for, um, you know, a victim, a suspect, a murder weapon, evidence, um, witnesses, uh, things of that nature. And we have laws and rules and regulations that govern uh, human behavior. So we have courts, you know, we have judges, we have police, we have jails, we have prisons. Um, all these rules that um, kind of govern human behavior. You don't have that for cryptids. So you're not going to catch a cryptid and question him. You know, you're not going to be able to, uh, he is the murder weapon. So um, it, that's where you have to quickly ascertain the nature of the crime and provide the right tools to solve that crime. In this case, somebody that has tracking ability, somebody that's familiar with, with these kinds of creatures. And there are units out there that are specially trained for this kind of uh, investigation. But I saw um, people with um, you know, police backgrounds trying to use a, a police methodology that would be applied towards human on human crime um, but it has stood the test of time, and it's a great method for, you know, determining um, innocence and guilt and um, conclusions with regards to investigations on human to human crime. However, it's just it's the wrong tool to, to use in this particular case. In other words, somebody came to this, to this problem with a screwdriver when they needed a hammer, you know, so, you know, a different tool for a different job. Um, the other thing I noticed that um, some of the researchers were focused on absolute truths as opposed to plausible truths, even though the stories they supported lacked absolute truth. So, you know, that kind of, you know, hypocrisy, I'm just not comfortable with. And I think you got to apply the same rules to every story and to every every storyteller. Um, I think if you're going to be fair about this. Um, researchers were also focused on trying to make Roger's story fit within their own belief system instead of taking the story the way Roger delivered it. I will admit I was guilty of that at first. I thought this was another version of the stories we already knew. And as I got into it, I found out it wasn't. It was something entirely different. Um, so the other thing that um, you know, we discovered is, you know, researchers lack knowledge on delineating um, local authority from federal authority. Um, who is the executive agent uh, in various types of crimes? So for example, the FBI is the executive agent for missing persons. Well, the CIA is the executive agent for uh, cryptid management. In Roger's case, I don't think it was the CIA, but a state sponsored group or possibly a park service or USDA group of special you know, game wardens um, I can't be certain. I, I'm really guessing on that. You know, when I talk to and ask about the, you know, the CIA, they claim they did not have um, a report of this particular incident. They acknowledge participation in other incidents in the LBL, but not this particular one. But they did say that some states over the last 30 years um, have hired contractors and have stood up their own types of units to handle these kinds of incidents. And although they're rare, they do exist. Um, I also found that researchers couldn't get along with each other and are reluctant to collaborate on finding the truth. They are only focused on their truth. You know, and that's, that's unfortunate. And um, that kind of creates a, a low trust environment in the cryptid research community. And that's why you see so many people now um, flocking to, to Steve's channel, How to Hunt, to tell their cryptid story because we've created an environment where people don't always feel comfortable talking on, on one of the cryptid channels here. And that's, that's unfortunate, but that, that, the result of that has driven people to Steve's channel. And, and now instead of it being a hunting channel, it's all about telling your story on, on Bigfoot and whatnot. So, uh, but he, he gets a lot of great, great um, uh, raw source material. So that's, if you want to hear really good stuff um, that you don't hear anywhere else, that's the place to go because people, that's a trusted place now. So people are going there. Um, also, uh, I noticed that researchers uh, became victims of groupthink. They lack the intestinal fortitude to break out of the group and do real research for fear of ridicule 
from the cryptid research community. Okay, that's what I'm just talking about, low trust. You know, now you have people within the community that are afraid to speak out on, on, you know, reviewing or investigating a particular topic because of what, you know, other researchers will say. So I noticed that and um, that was a little surprising to me. And the only researcher I witnessed that kind of broke away from the groupthink mentality uh, was Barton Nunley. And God bless him. Um, he was... He was the one that, that struck out on, on doing a good interview with, with Roger and kind of left, you know, all the naysayers behind. So good for him. Um, also, researchers didn't really contemplate there was more than one family ever killed at the LBL. And I was one of those. I thought these stories all had to do with, um, you know, the same family. I was wrong. Um, Based on the available information, I think there's at least two, probably three cases of families killed in a short period of time in the LBL. And then just to add more to this, in none of these stories, there were no dogmen involved. So <laughs> there were no dogmen injured in the, in the making of any of these stories. <laughs> so, okay, so what do we know now? Well, I feel that Roger's story stands alone, is plausible, and is believable. He described places, people, things, procedures that, um, that was more detailed than what the researchers even knew. So um, I also believe that Roger's probably withholding a little information, and he's probably withholding that and saving it for the TV show he's supposed to do. So that's fine. I think we'll discover a little more there. So um, the one thing I would warn you guys is do not contaminate Roger's story with any of the information from the other stories. Uh, there are a few common threads, but these stories are completely different. And I'll go over what's common and what's different, you know, in another slide. So I believe there's actually several families that have met their fate in the LBL. In terms of four member families, I think there's at least three. Now, the thing that makes it difficult is there are known cases uh, that we know about in the LBL, and there's many unknown. The unknown far outnumber the known by a huge margin, but um, sometimes we'll get a piece of information and we'll try to make it fit into one of the known stories. And that's just not fair to, to us trying to make something fit into uh, some place that doesn't belong, when in fact that, that piece of information we got, it belonged to its own story, and we just don't know what it is. And it's because the people there are, are very unwilling to come forward and, and tell what they know, whether they're police, park rangers, employees, um, visitors. Um, when they're told to be quiet, they, they pretty much do that. So there's a lot more covered up than, than, than are uncovered, so let's just leave it at that. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through the storyboards, the way um, Roger told the story and we interpret. Now, again, I couldn't get Roger to review this. I wanted him to review it and just say, hey, does this make sense? Does this look accurate to you? And since he wasn't willing to do that, um, I, I did have to just kind of go by his word and kind of uh, put this in my mind and then figure out how to put it on paper to explain it so that I'd understand it, but also so you'd understand it. So in this case, we start from the attack. If you recall, um, they just arrived at the campground. They had unhooked the car from behind the, the camper. And uh, the father, Levi, and the son, Stephen, were outside uh, cutting up some firewood. They're going to start a fire. Um, Roger was inside. He was going to do some target practice with a 410 shotgun and was um, grabbing some, some soup cans and uh, some shotgun shells for the shotgun. It was in the early evening. It was you know, late afternoon. So this happened, I'm guessing, around 5.45 you know, p.m. They'd been on the ground a little while. And um, it was kind of cool. So it was around 40, 41 degrees. And so that means the windows and the door was closed. Well, Roger's inside. He starts hearing some, some loud talking, some shouting. <clears throat> As he goes to look out the, the window, well, at that time, Levi runs around the front of the camper or front of the motorhome, opens the driver's door, reaches behind the seat and grabs a 20 gauge shotgun and goes running back around to the, the passenger side of the vehicle. 
And at this point, um, you know, Roger's watching and this creature has Stephen from behind and it just killed him. And Levi shot him in the shoulder, the right shoulder, neck and throat area and face with the 20 gauge shotgun. Um, so while this is happening, Roger is looking out the main entrance door. Um, and here you have Stephen you know, being attacked by this creature. And then you have Levi shooting him. So we go on to act two. We'll see, you'll see that the, the creature has killed Stephen, has ran up to Levi and, and killed Levi, and is now making his way past the motorhome, you know, from front to rear. And as he passes the side door, Roger has the door open and he aims the 410 shotgun at the creature and pulls the trigger. So again, the second shot at much closer range um, hits the creature in the right shoulder, neck, throat area, the same place it had been shot by the 20 gauge. In the meantime, the girls, the mother, Diane, and the daughter, Connie, are in the back of the motorhome, you know, in the master bedroom. So what we see next is the creature runs off. Uh, Roger comes out of the motorhome and crawls underneath it and lodges himself between the drive shaft and the floorboards of the motorhome to hide. He assumes the girls are following him. When in fact, when he's down there, he then hears them scream, it's coming in the back window. And then he hears the attack occur, you know, just inches from where he's, he's hiding under the vehicle. So in this case, um, you know, what we're going to look at next is, here's where I have a, um, a problem with Roger's story, is he thinks there are two creatures. So he thinks there's two creatures, but he, never, he admits he never saw a second creature. So you have to remember that when he saw the creature run away, he quickly came out of the motorhome, crawled underneath it, wedged himself between the drive shaft and the floorboards of the motorhome, where he had a good, you know, hiding place, and it would be difficult to probably get him out of there um, for a creature, you know, this size, but not impossible. So he sees the creature run away. He never sees the creature run back, runs back. He, he thinks a different creature runs up and then breaks out the, the rear window and, um, and attacks the, the girls. Well, well, so what I would argue, it's the same creature. He ran away. He sensed by either hearing or smelling or seeing the girls in the back window, turns around, runs back, breaks out the back window, jumps in the motorhome, uh, kills, kills the, uh, the mother, Diane, and then kills Connie. And he's going to take Connie with him. So you got to remember this creature is wounded and he left a blood trail. Um, now, why do I think it's just one and not two? Well, first of all, the werewolf is a solitary creature. It does not hunt in pairs, packs, or anything else. It hunts and for the most part um, is alone, except when it has a family. And a male werewolf will have one, two, maybe even three females that he will partner with for life. And they will raise a family, but the male is the one that goes out and does the hunting. It's very rare you see a female werewolf, um, but they do exist. It's just you don't, you don't see them. So in this case, I think this is the same werewolf, um, and I'll, I'll get into more reasons why as we go through the rest of the storyboards. So let's move on to Act 5. So in Act 5, um, nothing has changed except um, the whole family is now deceased. Uh, Roger is still under the motorhome hiding. At this point, the creature has left the motorhome um, with Connie. And, you know, I think he, his intention was to eat her. And that's the only reason he would take the body. So as we, as we look at the, uh, the werewolf's departure from the motorhome and then the evidence that was found later at the crime scene, we'll see that about halfway to his journey, um, he drops the body. He drops Connie on the ground. 
He's bleeding so bad. I'm, I'm estimating that he is getting weak and tired from blood loss. And so he leaves the body and he wants to go find a safe place to rest. And so he continues on, he climbs a tree, he, he finds a good resting place in the tree and he passes out from lack of blood or from loss of blood. And then he dies, he dies in the tree. And that's why Connie's body was found on the ground 50 to 100 meters behind uh, the motor home. Um, yet there's no creature, but there's still a blood trail that's leading away from her body. You and Roger kind of mentioned this when him and I were chatting. So about this time, Roger thinks the coast is clear and he wants to make an escape. So he crawls out from under the motor home. He runs out to the main road and takes off running to the right. And eventually a farmer in a um, Ford pickup, you know, pick him up and, and takes him to his house. As soon as they get there, the farmer makes a phone call and he's on the phone for quite some time. And while he's on that phone, um, I guess describing what's going on, um, agents are dispatched to the crime scene. And two agents um, arrive at the farmer's house to pick up Roger. And so while the agents are picking up Roger, the rest of those, that team was actually at the crime scene um, looking over the carnage and looking at the evidence. So in this case, they found the bodies. Um, eventually they find uh, Connie's body, the little girl, and eventually they do find, you know, later on they find uh, the werewolf dead in the tree. So now Roger come back, comes back to the crime scene. He's walked around. He describes everything that happened to the agents. There was one agent in particular that escorted him by the name of Waltz. Um, and eventually when they find the, the creature, they put some spotlights on it because it is dark. Um, and they point the creature out to Roger and say, hey, is this the creature that, that did this? And, yep, that's the one. Um, but, you know, at this point, Roger still thinks there's a second one. Uh, but it would make no sense for there to be two werewolves hunting together. That's just not, it's never been reported, never been observed by people had observed them for years and years. Um, and there's no reason to leave Connie's body behind if in fact, um, if, the, if the goal was to, to eat it. In this case, the creature was, had become so weak that the only way he could go forward was leaving the body behind and then moving to a safe place to rest, not knowing that he was actually gonna bleed out when he got there. So in this case, they, they observed the creature in the tree dead. And Roger said that there were uh, several people at the crime scene. And when I asked him who they were, he wasn't sure. They looked, he kind of thought National Guardish, but maybe not. Um, they had you know, military style vehicles. And then he said that, hey, they had Jeeps and there were big spotlights mounted on the back of these Jeeps. And so right away, I'm thinking, okay, so Military vehicles, Jeeps, that's the old M1151, which is the Army Jeep that we used up until the late 80s and maybe even early 90s. And so they had some of these, all the people there knew each other. And so whenever he'd walk around with, with Walt, uh, Walt would walk up to one of the other agents and they would greet him and they would chat. In some cases, um, you know, it's, he said the, the agents would, would stand at attention. You know, like Walt was a superior officer and they all worked for him. And so that's why in Roger's case, there were no law enforcement officers. Uh, there were no medics. Uh, there were no coroners uh, or fish and game at the scene of the crime. This particular agency, whoever they were, um, had complete control and autonomy over the crime scene. So nobody else was invited. Now, later on, we don't know who else was invited. Uh, they may have brought in a coroner or other specific uh, people after they'd taken Roger away from here. Uh, so that's part of the story. It's a little bit of a blind spot. Um, I, I don't know if, if these guys are equipped to handle the deceased or not. And typically in the civilian world, you would have um, the coroner would come in and, and review and handle the remains. So 
that part of the story we don't know about. Of course, you know, here it is years later, and we don't even know where these people are buried. We don't know their last names. Roger gave up their first names. The last names he's going to reveal on the TV show, I believe. So, so this is where all the, the storyboards I put together, you know, from the crime scene itself, the way Roger described it. So if Roger's looking at this, he might think it looks a little different. Um, but without his input, I kind of had to go by what he said. So now let's look at, uh, let's compare these stories. So there's some particular characteristics that run through all these st stories. But like I said, in case number one, Roger's case, I think his story stands alone. Now here's where the common, the common themes are. Victims, family of four, family of four, family of four, family of four. Okay, defining characteristic would have to be the young, the young girl, young female. In Roger's case, she was found on the ground. In all the other cases, she was found in the tree, partially consumed. Okay, what type of creature? Well, in Roger's case, it was a six foot five werewolf. In World Bigfoot Radio and Kumbo's case, um, both Bigfoot or Bigfoot type creature. Now, in, in Kumbo's defense, he mentions both. I think that was by mistake. Um, what he was referring to mostly, I think, was a Bigfoot type creature. Um, uh, Victor uh, was a werewolf and it was seven foot 11 inches tall. And the description of the wounds found on the father's body indicated that of a werewolf. It was something that had four very large claws and then a side claw, like from a thumb um, on, on one of the victim's back. So that's, that would be a werewolf. So looking at the type of camper mentioned, in the case of Roger, it was a motorhome towing a little red Chevy Chevette. In the case of World Bigfoot Radio, it was a camper trailer. In the case of Kumbo, I think he mentioned RV. Um, and a driver's side and passenger side. So I guess that could be either one, but I took it to mean motorhome and I may be wrong. Um, the case of Victor, he was very specific. It was an 18 foot camper trailer. Um, Jan Thompson also, also mentioned, used the word motorhome. Uh, so I, I don't know if, if they actually, if the agents she got the information from used that term or she just assumed that, that that's what it was. So we don't know. Um, now the first responders in, in this case with Roger, there were agents. I don't know where they were from. Um, unsure if it was Kentucky DNR or fed. Uh, I think it's unlikely it's the feds, but I don't know. Um, the first responders for all the other cases involved DNR, Leo's and coroner. And in a couple of cases, the military was allegedly involved. So you can see these stories have many similarities, but significant differences in the places that it count, that really count. So there's no way you would confuse an 11 foot, six inch Bigfoot with a six foot five werewolf. I mean, those are, are completely far apart. Um, there's no way to compare a motor home with a, you know, a camper trailer. You know, one is driven, the other one is towed. Um, and I think people can distinguish the difference between DNR, law enforcement officers, military, coroners, or other. So um, these, these stories have some uh, defining traits uh, that differentiate them from, in this case, from Roger's story. Okay, so you just looked at that and you're thinking, there's no way that that many families of four could have perished in the same time frame at the LBL. That's just so unlikely. So that's what I saw when I when I first looked at what my chart actually was telling me. Well, families of four, all of them. What are the chances of that happening? Well, so I decided to find out what the chances actually were. So if I look at the U.S. population in the year 1985, which is you know two or three years after these incidents supposedly occurred. Um, and I couldn't get exact data for 82, but 85 will be close enough. And it's, I'm trying to illustrate a point. And I don't have to be precise in my point, but I have to be able to um, illustrate the point. 
So in this case, in 1985, we had a population in the US of 240 million. So, okay, 240 million. Well, how many of that 240 million um, involve four member families? Well, it just so happened that um, those demographics were tracked. And so four member families in 1985 were approximately 16% of the US population. Okay, so how much is 16%? Well, 16% of 240 is, you know, 38 million plus. And when I divide that by four, I get families of four that equal 9.6 million. So 9.6 million families of four in 1985. Okay. Even if I'm off a little bit, let's say I'm off 600,000, 9 million is still quite a few families of four in the U.S., Okay. So then I got to thinking, well, how many people actually visit the LBL every year? Well, so the LBL attracts up to 1.5 million visitors per year. Now, I don't have exact dates or numbers for 1982 or the early 80s, uh, but I got a, a whole stretch of years after that. And so I just kind of averaged it into 1.5 million uh, per year. And 16% of that 1.5 million are about 60,000 four-person families. So that's a lot of four-person families that on an average visit the LBL every year. But I know that some people are thinking, God, that's high, that can't be right. So, all right, well, let's, well, we can play with the math a little bit, but you can do the math as easy as I can. So let's, um, let's see what else we got. So, if we look at the years from 2005 all the way to 2017, you see that LBL has a pretty um, healthy um, tourist visit. Uh, their numbers are, are, are pretty high, but you know, LBL is not even in the top 10 in the United States for most visits, visited campgrounds. I mean, you have Yosemite, you have um, uh, several others uh, that, that are in the top 10. And so the LBL, I think, falls in the top 20, but not in the top 10. So if we were to look at, you know, 60,000 families of four visiting the LBL on an average annually, okay? So I know some of you are thinking that sounds way too high. Well, so let's just cut that in half. We'll call it 30,000 families, all right? So 30,000 BAM, 30,000 four-member families, visiting the LBL. Now, granted, I am not including one, two, three, five, six, you know, member families, only four member families, because what we saw is a trend of, of these attacks in the five stories I reviewed, all mentioned four member families. So what I'm trying to show you is it's not um, uh, beyond the realm of possibility that more than four, more than, than uh, one four member family met their fate here. Okay. So, so bear with me. So do we have any idea of how many incidents even occurred in the LBO? Well, no, we don't. Um, uh, since many researchers have tried to get information from locals and from employees and from police and DNR, uh, they've been very quiet on this. And so we don't, we, we seldom get any news out that's, that's really newsworthy for us. And occasionally somebody will leak something and then we got to figure out what, what it, if that's part of the story or the whole story. However, um, we did get some clues. And so in one of the Q&A sessions that, um, that Jeff Nodani had with Victor um, last year, um, Victor was actually questioned about Jody Cook's story. So the Jody Cook story I'm referring to is the one regarding the fish and game officer who witnessed a large cryptid kill two people on a beach while he was fishing in his boat in 1979. Okay, so Victor responded with, um, I have nothing like that in my database for 1979. As a matter of fact, 1979 was a light year for us. We only had nine incidents in the LBL we had to respond to. Okay, so that's kind of revealing, only nine, and that's a light year. We never got a chance to ask what a heavy year might look like, but um, that was his response. 
Also, I, I recently heard another LBL um, story where a lady that lives near the LBL drives through it quite often in, in route to work or to see family or to get to other places. And she said on more than one occasion, she's seen you know, black SUV speeding through the park. Okay, so I hear that and that's Latin for, you know, cryptid hunters, you know, basically the CIA guys um, tracking down or responding to an incident. When I hear things like that, that's the first thing that comes to mind. So that's, that wouldn't seem unusual for me to hear that about uh, somebody seeing that in the LBL. So I got to thinking, well, if we, if Victor considers 1979 and having only nine visits to the LBL, a light year, well, here it is 42 years later, how many incidents we have, would we have had between then and now? And so the number I came up with, you know, if I just take nine and multiply it times 42, it's a pretty high number. And, and most people would choke on that. So I said, okay, so let me cut that in half. Let's make it 4.5 incidents per year. Use that as a, as a factor. And that came up, that, that actually came out to 189 incidents to date. So I realized that there are people out there that will even doubt that, regardless of what the math says. They, they just won't believe it. So I said, okay, let's cut that in half again. So now we're at like two and a quarter per month. And that would actually give us 95 incidents between 1979 and now that um, Victor's group would have had to respond to, so the CIA. Um, so that's actually quite a few incidents in yeah, 95. Uh, so anything above 95, you know, assuming my uh, math, my initial math was a good planning factor for that, uh, you know, it could be a whole lot more than that. But let's just go with 95. So of the 95 incidents, how many of those do we actually know about? Well, I know about maybe four or five. The Crypto Studies Institute mentions they knew of perhaps 13 incidents that actually involved fatalities. And I don't think they know all the ones I know. And I certainly don't know all the ones they know. So I think combined, if we compare notes, it's probably more than 13. So anyway, let's, let's see what else we got here. So we established that there is a sizable population of four member families visiting the LBL on an annual basis. Okay. So that's, that's quite, a, that's quite an exposure. Four member families um, coming to the LBL are, are very well represented. Okay. So we're still not sure of how many cryptids, how well represented the cryptids are, you know, on that part of the, the equation. And so we know we have lots of four member families. Let's take a look at what we think might be there for cryptids. Well, in March of 2020, um, Victor was asked about, you know, how many werewolves were in the LBL area? Well, on, on 27 March, he responded with within a 25 mile radius from the LBL center. Uh, right now, according to my computer, there are 20 tagged werewolves within a 25 mile radius on the Northeast side and nine within a 25 mile radius on the southwest side of the area. And this number does not include wild ones or the offspring of wild ones or the offspring of the tagged ones. Uh, so some of these creatures are tagged and they were tagged and released. They were actually raised in captivity. Um, now, a week later, he was also asked about how many dog men we're in and around Princeton, Kentucky. So Princeton is right outside of the LBL. And so within a 22 mile radius from the Princeton city center, he said there were 13 dog men actually in town in the city center right now. There are 91 dog men that are mostly on the Northeast side and there's 78 dog men showing up in the LBL on the West and Southwest of the town center. Those are just the tagged ones, not the wild ones, and certainly not their offspring. So we have an idea that um, the dog man and werewolf in particular like this area. Now these are snapshots in time, certainly don't represent the same numbers that might be there today. Um, both creatures are nomadic. However, they will typically stay in an area that, that gives them security and food and water um, until it's time to move on, and then they'll move on. 
uh, but they they can they can move. Um, I think the dog man is um, a lot more nomadic than the werewolf. Uh, I think the werewolf will stay in an area as long as those three things exist, uh, and he feels safe. Uh, there's plenty of food and water. Now keep in mind that this is just a snapshot in time, um, but there are other people that have written books. You know, Barton Unley has written some books on cryptids, in particular um, Kentucky, Tennessee area. And, and these things um, go back in time. They were known in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s um, of having these kinds of creatures in the area. So this is an area in the United States where um, there has been a persistent cryptid presence uh, for a long time. So that's not unusual, I would think, for this particular area. So now I've established we have an adequate four-member family uh, presence or representation on an annual basis at the LBL. We know that there's plenty of cryptids there. We don't know how many, but we know that cryptids in the area are plentiful. Um, not just now, but they have been for a couple hundred years. So let's see what else we got going on. All right, let me conclude here. Um, so I think, again, Roger's story stands alone. Um, you know, he's the only one of all these stories that's actually a witness um, that, and he has a date and he has names of the family, the, the victims. The others don't have dates and don't have uh, victim names, at least that can be revealed. Victor has the names, but he's not authorized to release the names of the family that um, his father was involved with. Um, I don't think um, Jan Thompson has the name of those victims. I don't think Kumbo or World Bigfoot Radio has the name of the victims. And in this case, um, you, you can see as I laid it out, all these cases are a little different. You know, I have a werewolf, and then we have a Bigfoot, and then we have another werewolf, and the werewolves are different sizes. You know, one's an adult alpha male. The other one is, is a young male. Um, and you got a girl in a tree and then a girl found on the ground. So there's enough differences here to, to really differentiate these stories. So, um, so hopefully what I've shown you is the possibility of, of four member families possibly meeting their fate at the hands of cryptids in the LBL. And not just one family, several families could have the opportunity to have met their fate. Okay, so I do believe Roger's story, and I do plan on using it in my book. Um, the only thing that I couldn't justify was including two creatures, and so I've left it with one creature. Um, and, and for reasons I've said, creature solitary, it's a very fast creature. And so because um, Roger's not familiar with it, he doesn't know that these things are, are lightning fast. As a matter of fact, Victor said they clocked a werewolf running at 48 miles an hour on two legs. That's uh, for a dog man, they clocked at 42 mile an hour and Bigfoot on a good day could hit 33 mile an hour. So they had done plenty of studies on these creatures um, when they were involved you know, with them in the, in the early days of studying their capabilities and behavior. So um, in this case, I think the creature ran away and turned around and ran right back. And they, for those that um, have had um, encounters, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, most of the encounters people have are going to be with dog matter, Bigfoot, and those guys are fast enough, and the werewolf is faster than both of them. So just, just put that in perspective. Um, the one thing I think that, that really helped with, with Roger's story was um, the blood trail and the amount of blood loss. Because typically we would hear about a creature getting shot, you know, at point blank range uh, with a high powered rifle, a dog man center mass and doesn't do anything to him. Well, that's because you have to, a dog man, you have to kill a head with a headshot. Um, in the case with Roger and Levi, they both shot this creature in the same area with shotguns. But what they did is they got, they hit a, a critical point um, and some soft tissue around the throat area that caused this thing to bleed out and bleed out quick. Because just a normal shoulder shot probably isn't going to cause that. Getting shot, you know, in the side of the face isn't going to cause that getting shot in the throat and the neck area. Uh, you have a lot of blood that flows through that area. And I think that what they did is they, 
they severed the jugular on, on those two shots, which caused, which caused the creature to bleed out exceptionally fast. So that's, um, that is very plausible. I think that makes sense. Uh, and that's why the story kind of works the way that Roger told it. Otherwise, you know, we would still be trying to contemplate how is it that a you know, creature died from two shotgun wounds when we have dozens of witnesses over time and over the whole space of the United States that have shot similar creatures, you know, um, mostly dog man at point blank range, did nothing to them. So anyway, so I think that's how we rationalize that particular part of the story. And I think that um, the way Roger told it and the way I shaped it into my investigation makes perfect sense. So I have no problem with that. Let's look at the backup slides. Okay, so those people are not familiar with the deuce and a half. So that's an army vehicle, it's 10 wheel drive. As you can see, it's got um, two rear axles and they're dual wheels each. And it also has front wheels that are also driven. So it makes it a 10 wheel drive. So when comparing the, the creature that World Big, Bigfoot Radio mentioned, I estimate him to be around 11 foot six. You can see this is the bed of this deuce and a half, this M35 is 12 inch or 12 feet long and nine or eight feet wide. And so this creature barely fit in the back of there, they said. Okay, so that would make him around 11, six, 11, six plus. And now as you compare him to a six foot man and compare him to the vehicle, you can see how, you know, he is, he will fit back here, but there's not much room for your luggage. And you know, once you get him in there, so just keep that in mind. That's the size comparison. And this isn't exact, but this, you get the point. Um, this is, is pretty close. So how would this, this World Bigfoot Radio um, Bigfoot actually match up to the motorhome that Roger claimed? Well, the 1982 Holiday Imperial, you know, it has a main entrance door that's 32 inches um, by 72 inches. So two and a half feet wide by six feet tall, okay? So this guy's 11'6", here's a six foot man. Um, could he fit in there? Probably not, but he can force his way in. And if he forces his way in any of the windows or in that door, he's gonna cause structural damage. Um, Cause one, he's gonna, he's, he has to catch his quarry because we know that Diane died in the trailer. So I, I only show this to illustrate how unlikely it is that this creature, a creature like this, would have been involved in this kind of crime. Um, there was no structural damage reported from the trailer. Roger saw it and would have reported that um, if in fact that was something to consider. Okay, so there were other cryptids mentioned that are, are just not part of this story. And I don't know how people come up with, with some of these cryptids, but um, I think Johnny Henderson, mentioned it best. He's from the Crypto Studies Institute. He goes, well, people are going to believe that the, the creature responsible is whatever their favorite, you know, cryptid is. And I, th I think he's right. So I heard this one mentioned a few times, the Gugway. Okay, so what's a Gugway? Well, Gugway originates from um, the Mi'kmaq Algonquian Indians, um, which are actually in, in North, Northeast Canada. New Brunswick and Nova Scotia to be specific. So how would one of these get from there all the way down to Kentucky? I don't know, um, but there's several names that the Gugwe goes by. Um, that all depends on what Indian dialect uh, you're, you're dealing with. And all the names are listed here, the alternative spellings, um, but it's, um, it's, they describe it as a, a man-eating ogre from Mi'kmaq Indian folklore. They were greedy, hairy, and sometimes described as having bear-like heads. They were also described as being taller than the tallest pine trees, which would make, um, excuse me, the creature 150 feet tall. Usually described, though, as 20 to 30 feet tall and large enough to carry children in a sack or in a bag. So we know that the Gugway doesn't come close to any of the descriptions we have for the creatures involved in these stories. Then the next one was the Genoshua. Okay, again, another uh, Native American um, 
name from a mythological rock giant, the cannibal giant of northeastern United States and Canada, Canada from the Seneca Iroquois, you know, tribes. Behavior rubs his body with, with tree resin and sand. Distribution, New York, Ontario, Canada. Um, also called the stone coat. They're described as being about twice as tall as humans with their bodies covered in rock hard scales that repel all normal weapons. They are associated with winter and ice and they hunt and eat humans. Okay. So we know that none of the creatures in these stories were covered with rock hard scales. So we can put that one to rest. And there was another one, the space monkey, or I'm sorry, the devil monkey. I, for one reason, I can't remember that name, but devil monkeys, uh, they have a tail and said to re resemble baboons. Uh, they've been cited, cited in California, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. And I guess they get around four to five feet tall. And then they were um, also, I guess, cited in Arizona. So I assume they probably exist or people are seeing them, but there's no way of confusing uh, a devil monkey with the creatures responsible for, for these particular crimes. Uh, one is much smaller. It has a tail. Nothing in the descriptions from the reports had tails and none of them had any relationship to a monkey. So anyway, so I just wanted to point that out as you're sitting and listening to other people talk about the LBL and what they think it was, well, let me just tell you what I'm pretty sure it wasn't. And so the, the names I heard described are the ones I've included here. And I can promise you that the creatures involved in those stories do not fall anywhere on the latest uh, dogman variant chart, okay? So none of the creatures involved in these stories or any of the types or variants um, on the latest dog man chart. So let's look at the timeline. So if you look at this timeline, now of all the stories involving the LBL and the families that, that um, met their fate there, Roger's story is actually the quickest. I estimated it started around 545, estimated time of attack. And, you know, by probably 9, 15, 9, 20, they were out of there. Um, so I estimated it'd be about three hours and 25 minutes and this whole thing was wrapped up. Um, you know, sunset occurred at, six, at um, 623. You had a full moon that night. Um, with the moon rise at 647, you know, so I'd looked at all the, the weather and um, astrological reports of the day uh, when I was trying to picture how this was actually going down. So that's how I knew it was kind of cool. Roger mentioned it was kind of cool. Well, we don't know what kind of cool means. I looked it up and found that it was like 41 degrees about the time of attack. So it was cool. So and just some more backup stuff uh, about the LBL. So that concludes my investigation of the LBL. Hopefully you guys got something out of it. Um, if you don't you know, believe the results, that's fine. At least I think you got some educated questions you can ask other researchers that, that might be pursuing this. Um, I don't see anybody else pursuing the LBL story. It's a lot of work and um, I'm not sure if there's anything to gain out of it. In my particular case, I wanna get the story right for a book that I'm writing on cryptids. So I was motivated by other reasons. Uh, most people I suspect they'll just stick to the story they like, but I wanted to provide you guys um, uh, my results of the investigation I did on this. And so hopefully that was useful in, in understanding more about uh, the LBL and the family that, that met their fate there, or families, I should say. Um, I'm going to post this on my outdoors channel. That is not going to be a cryptids channel, and there won't be a lot of cryptid content there. Whenever I do an investigation like this, I'll probably post it up there, but for the most part, it's going to be other things. Um, so if you're looking for cryptid content, I'm sorry, but a wolf cow outdoors is not going to be the place to go. Um, also, if you do run across um, uh, any content relating to Sasquatch or Dogman using MindSpeak, 
cloaking or just disappearing in front of you, those kinds of stories I'd be interested in. Um, also, there's going to be uh, when you hear stories of Bigfoot being able to enter into classified nuclear weapons storage facilities, you know, they can leap over the fence and no one stops them. And yet, if you or I went and <laughs> got near the fence, we'd probably be mowed down with automatic gunfire. Um, those kinds of stories, uh, they'll be helpful for my next project, as well as encounters with Bigfoot and all of your electrical devices lose their power. Your batteries are drained in your phone, your cameras, your car, your ATV, whatnot. Um, stories related to that uh, would also be helpful in what I'm doing. Uh, and any uh, sightings of uh, Bigfoot or Dogman around UFOs or with orbs, um, those kinds of stories would be helpful for where I'm going. So this next project is really talking about uh, the origins of, of Bigfoot and Dogman both. And I have a lot of material already, um, but I like to sprinkle in some examples uh, with some of the research I've done. Like, you know, so-and-so um, ran into a Bigfoot on his farm and it was surrounded by glowing yellow orbs. And next thing he saw is that it disappeared. Um, and there were no tracks departing the area. You know, things like that, I can sprinkle into uh, what I've found out. It's part of the origin story. So if you find any stuff related to that, by all means, um, I'd be happy to receive a link from you or comments or where to look for something that you've encountered uh, for, for that kind of information. So you can either uh, reach me at um, wolfcaoutdoors at gmail.com. Or you can continue to send it to SaxonWarlord2 at gmail.com and he will get it to me. So anyway, thanks so much. Appreciate all the help, participation. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, you have a good, great day. Hunter out.